Welcome everybody uh, to, to, to tonight's artist lecture. Um, my name is Blake Weld. I am the technical director and gallery manager for Texas Women's University uh, for the Department of Visual Arts. Uh, tonight, we have the honor of Erica Felicella, who is a practicing artist and arts professional, currently living and working in Oak Cliff. Her current artistic practice includes endurance and durational-based performance, site-specific installation, and new media works. As a curator, Felicella has had the opportunity to create unique and, um, and immersive experiences in both traditional and non-traditional spaces in and around North Texas. Felicella joined Aurora's executive team as their executive producer in 2019. She has been working toward expanding the organization's growth and outreach, as well as overseeing the variety of programming the organi organization produces with a strong focus on Aurora's signature biennial. She continues her pursuit of being an arts advocate by working with other arts nonprofits, serving as a board member, sitting on committees, producing events, and other volunteer efforts. She's constantly finding a way to dig deeper and grow not only her own art practice, but also to expand the careers of other artists. I am super excited to have Erica here. I've had the privilege working with her. Um, super, just like super humbled about everything. Um, very excited to have here. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Erica to the virtual stage. Thanks, Blake. Um, you guys caught me on the best lighting hour um, that I get every day when the sun is out. Um, I'm super excited to be here. My talk is going to kind of jump all over the place. Uh, I do a lot of different things in a lot of different areas. So um, we'll see how it goes. But uh, basically, what it all comes down to is that community and passion for the arts are what drives me uh, in its entirety. Uh, it started my career at a very young age. Sorry guys, technical issue, there we go. Um, basically, you know, it's like, I started art at a very, very wee tiny self in New Hampshire, um, making earthworks and doing things that I had no idea what they were doing. Somebody just gave me a Swiss army knife and let me go off into the wilderness. Um, I made a lot of work at that time. I spent a lot of time by myself and then it just kind of left and fell into the background. Uh, I spent years being a uh, uh, athlete all the way to college. Um, I tried to study not art, uh, although photography almost led me to Brooks Institute when uh, right after high school. But no, I went and played sports and studied science instead. Um, but, you know, push come to shove, I became an artist once again uh, through uh, just started with drawing and, and worked my way back to photography, which was my root medium in high school. So basically, you know, uh, what do I do is always a difficult question for me to answer. Also, how did I get to where I am? Uh, I base it on a few factors when I talk to people. Um, I try to make it aware, everybody aware that the first and foremost, I'm an artist. Um, photography was my first medium. Uh, then I stumbled upon performance with a strong focus on, as Blake said, duration and endurance. Um, I've transitioned into new media works as of late as a means to continue performance beyond uh, the initial time it happens. And I'm always curious. So through research and development, whatever kind of work I need to learn along the way, uh, I do. Uh, I became a curator kind of by accident. Um, somebody asked me when I was real young, hey, do you wanna curate this show with me? Uh, one of my philosophies is say yes. So I said yes. And I went home and Googled curator. So uh, that's how I became a curator. Nothing fancy to it, but I did my first show uh, called Viva La Woman. And it was an all female uh, exhibition back in Fair Park when it was all gritty. Uh, I love a non-traditional space and they've always been my favorite even to this day. Over time, I became a producer as well. Uh, the size of events and exhibitions 
that I were doing uh, went from like 100 people to 500 people to 800 people to 1,000 people. And now working with Aurora in their biennial, they're now up to 50,000 people. So a lot of things have happened in between. I also work in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I'm currently, as Blake said, with Aurora, but I have worked with many nonprofits in the last 18 years, uh, from everything from ground level volunteer work all the way up to being an executive director and everything in between. Uh, I put the definition of artist here for a specific reason. Uh, first, the first definition that I looked up said, just somebody who paints. And I was like, oh, they need a new definition. And so I found a little bit better one. And basically it took me a very long time to find comfort in that word. Uh, so now I say it still with trepidation, but you know, it's a never ending, you know, growth process and uh, you know, creative imagination is basically how I live. Um, you know, this is real simple. Uh, I'm incredibly shy. I'm a huge introvert. Uh, talking is <laughs> something I do often, but definitely not something that uh, doesn't scare me every day. Um, but over the years, I started developing a process and uh, through watching and learning other artists and slowly but surely it opened my doors to everything and every pro um, body of work I've ever produced. I was an incredibly shy kid, but art was always like an outlet for me. I could perform poetry and then I'd be quiet afterwards. I could be on stage and be incredibly loud. Um, but uh, yeah, I always love to be, you know, behind the curtain, which is why photography was such a preferred medium for me for a very long time. And there's just, um, I always had a desire to have my voice and my story be told. Um, we'll talk a little bit down the line, but one of my biggest things that I try to address in my work is mental health um, and the community around it and the stigmas that still exist. So we'll get down to that a little later. But, you know, aesthetical bouncing is kind of the best way to describe my career for a very long time. You know, it's like who I was in my early 20s uh, got lost many times. I learned from some great masters of photography, uh, mostly in the commercial industry for a long time. And I learned lighting techniques and then I realized they were weaving their way into my work and then I'd push them out. Uh, and so, you know, I, my work looked a lot like others uh, over time and then I'd have to try again. So over time went from flat to round, basically I'm describing that as, you know, it, it was very, dimensional and flat at the time. And over time, I learned how to grow into a more expanded approach to art, uh, to layer it, to, to have a deeper conversation. Um, and basically just to get to a place where, you know, when you stood in front of the work, it made you think more. It, doesn't, it wasn't just about being pretty. It wasn't just about the lighting being well done. Um, I basically grew out of technique and into dialogue. So it was a lot of, a lot of mishaps, but I found it. I, I like to call me a yo-yo for a long time. Also, um, that's a very young me in this picture. Uh, even though I like to be, you know, behind the camera, the way I describe it is that, you know, it was really hard to pay for a model when you're really young. So uh, I just, I used myself a lot. Um, this was back in the film days as well. Yes, I loved my, my film and I miss it dearly. But, um, you know, this is, this is the early stages of me working with compositing as well. Um, don't look too close. There's plenty of mistakes in that image. So when it comes down to like, what do I focus on in my art practice? You know, I, I was thinking about this and then I realized I made this list that was incredibly long. Um, but, but it is incredibly long. And the first and foremost, the thing that I try to bring awareness to is mental health. It is not necessarily specific illness, but it's just something that in humanity, uh, we all relate to. I find it an incredibly relevant topic since the pandemic hit. Uh, a lot of people are experiencing anxiety and depression for the first time. 
so uh, it's it's definitely you know I'm able to talk a little bit more about the work that I've done in the past and the stuff I'm working towards in the future. Um, community engagement it's in everything that I do, every job that I do, every work I develop. Um, the, this group up here in the top um, was just a, a group that trusted me. I showed them kind of a empty space that had almost no electricity, terrible lighting, and uh, they went with me anyway. Um, and we put off a, a really great, you know, exhibition inside a, uh, a warehouse on a really hot day. And I love being able to be a champion for other artists, uh, especially when they're uh, intimidated or scared of a space. So it, it goes beyond curating for me. It, it's like cheerleading for me in a lot of ways. I think um, I know for me, like I've gone through a lot of experiences over the years that I sure would have loved a cheerleader. So I try to bring the pom-poms to every, every exhibition that I, I oversee. Social response. Um, I just, I believe in my practice that, uh, you know, it's my responsibility as an artist to focus on today's environment. Um, my, my chosen discussion sometimes is political, sometimes is about, you know, health, but, you know, it's, I, I, take, I take deep, deep responsibility in the voice that I use. Connected journey. This again is just about, you know, through other artists and through other communities, you know, I get my voice out of my head and let um, other artists like fix problems for me. We work together. Um, and, and I try to remove my ego as much as possible in everything that I do. Elevating artists kind of already talked about this, but it's just another example of what I do. Mentorship. I always have at least one or more artists under my wing that can call me anytime with any questions. I can't imagine having a career without it. Uh, the one thing that most people know about me, I always take the meeting, always. If you say coffee somewhere, I've never met you, I will meet you. It's changed my practice entirely. It has opened doors, it has led me to a lot of the stuff I'm working on today, everything from my own um, performances to working on policy or working on, with the city to change a structure for a permit that we don't have yet. And when I uh, had a studio mate back in the early 2000s, this last line is I stole from her and she told me to always say yes and panic later. Um, that has been, my whole career uh, and uh, thank, thank, thankfully Google exists and it reduces some of the panic stress, but I always say yes to not always, not always correct, but I do it anyway. Um, these are just some examples of the photography that I've done over the years, everything from film to, uh, you know, I, I use toy cameras. There's some Diana work in here. There's some early stages of, you know, digital manipulation uh, before, I, you know, I, I was learning a lot over the way uh, through the years. And uh, several of these images are composites, uh, the one up uh, with the fake deer. It's just, I'm, I'm all about detail. Uh, it's, it's a part of everything that I do. Uh, those deers are life size. I did a lot of research on what is the size of an average deer. And then I decided to make cardboard, you know, three-dimensional objects, which you can't ever get that dust out of your house. So I highly recommend doing it in a studio. Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, it's like that image, I'm in there three times. Um, this was compositing was something I really loved and I worked with it a lot, but I also really like to do the unexpected. The boardroom with the dog collars, um, that's actually my father at the head of the table. It's called corporate static, and it's it's my response to you know corporations not really listening to what's going on in the world. The trick is I didn't tell any of them I was going to stick dog collars on them. I just invited them to this photo shoot with no information, and I like to get as close to an authentic response as possible. Luckily, they had fun, um, and I was nervous, 
for two days, but uh, it's turned out, you know, it's like they kind of understood the concept and these are all CEOs. That's another part of my work. Like I don't bring in just, you know, actors off the street. These are exactly who they're supposed to be. The couple with the, with the, the heart balloons, they are married, you know, certain things like that. Like that's, in, that's important to me. The musician down in the lower left, I brought her to Caddo Lake because her music is the perfect blend, uh, blend of Texas Americana and Louisiana folk. You know, it's like, it's the little details that, that matter to me. And that's a very little me with a camera. Um, this, is where, this is where my entire life changed. This is a big warning for everybody. Uh, if you have a studio or your house or whatever it is, get your insurance, get your equipment covered. Um, I did not. And all my, photo, all my photography equipment, which was about 15 years of collecting, just gone, gone overnight, total loss. But, you know, it didn't turn out to be that bad because the very next thought that I had was something that I didn't even know what it was called, but it was performance art. So I had to start my career basically from the beginning at 35 years old. I was already nervous because I started what I thought was my actual, you know, photography career in my early to mid twenties, uh, which I also felt was late. So 35, I felt like this, you know, veteran coming in, trying to, trying to figure out the art world again. But what I realized is that this medium just totally set me free. Uh, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to call it, but the idea I had, I knew it just, it, it would take me to new places and new, you know, new connections with the community. I was finally able to just get off the wall and get into the world. Um, and, and in a sense, I now was the camera. Um, I was no longer behind it. Uh, I was no longer in front of it. I was it myself. And uh, it was also, you know, it was the end of my camera. Uh, that had been, you know, part of my life since I was, you know, basically a little girl, but more seriously since I was 15. And then, you know, giving this talk made me count how many performances I've done since 2012. I put the number in there just because I was shocked. Um, I have now uh, successfully, successfully performed 21 performances uh, since I was 35, and uh, I'm still going, hopefully, for the next 20 years, I have enough material and notebooks in my brain uh, and just hiding in every little nook and cranny that I can possibly put them. Oh, this piece, just so you guys know, this was my very first performance. It was called Visible Shell. Uh, it was a 48 hour work and I was contained in an acrylic structure that was about three feet by four feet by six and a half feet completely locked in and um, just there. Uh, to, to show the passing of time, I changed the color of the paper from bottom to top. And I didn't, I didn't, it almost made it to the end. I had about five hours left. And the only reason I could count the time is because uh, I had to get up every hour to avoid blood clots. And so I tried to keep track of them the best I could. There's just some examples of performances over the years. Uh, up in the top left, there's one, this one's called Get Up. It's just an example of, you know, just how do you reemerge in life from being stuck? How do you, how do you deal with the emotions of, of like expanding oneself again and learning how to be whole? I learned a lot in this project. Um, I actually inhaled a lot of uh, Super 77, if you guys know what that is. It's, yeah, I see somebody's face. It's a really nasty 3M spray adhesive, but it worked because we had to keep the, the chalk that was poured on me, not on the ground. So uh, it was a fun performance. I had to put a lot of trust in people. They had to deadlift me um, off the ground so that we didn't mess up the, the imprints that were left. And uh, yeah, it took just a couple hours. It's a short performance for me. Down in the bottom, uh, it's called Resist the Pull. This was just a play on human uh, tension, 
and, and relaxing. Uh, I learned through this piece that tug of war is actually still a professional sport uh, in Europe. Uh, so resist the pull is actually is the moment at which the tension is on the line. So I found that to be something very relevant and important. So, you know, I was trying to get people to resist the desire to want to play the game. Um, but it's also one of the most stressful pieces because people almost entirely resisted and didn't interact with me at all, um, which is something I've learned over the years is that when I've put my work in a traditional um, performance space or art space, this was at the Dallas Contemporary, as the community were so used to watching art and not touching art. Uh, so this is the first time that people, that people didn't approach me. Uh, it took about an hour before somebody, uh, I just threw the rope out again and again and again. But eventually, you know, Somebody pulled and then it was, it was game on from there. In the middle, uh, this was my response to turning 40. Uh, I decided that I needed to tell my life story, stay up for 40 hours and type it on two different typewriters. Uh, I still haven't read it. I, I don't know why I'm not quite ready. Um, I'm also a terrible typer, uh, as we all know. I always say that we don't have command Z on a typewriter, so there's and I'm dyslexic, so I'm sure that is a very interesting read. Um, the last three hours to add the, you know, the engagement part of it, people were invited in and I loved it because they were picking up the paper off the ground. They were reading excerpts from it. Uh, they were, you know, I love how audience interacts with work. Um, and I, you know, you can never plan for it fully. Uh, the top right, that's called 140 truth or dare. That was before you could have more hundred, you could only have 140 characters on Twitter. Uh, I'm pretty sure if everybody looked closely, they would know whose tweets I decided to engage with. Uh, I was politically very mad at this time. And uh, I collected over a year's worth of Donald Trump's tweets and decided to encase an entire gallery, uh, floors, walls, and, and, and whatnot. Um, it was, it was mentally a very exhausting process. I, I don't recommend anybody spending, you know, time in a year, in a year of mental thought or, you know, spontaneous reaction, but I did. And then this piece down in the corner, it's called shift. Uh, this is just another example of my love for community. It was all about the, the need for people to work together. I put my complete trust in the community without a whole lot of, you know, prompting. There were several ropes tied around my waist. There had to be tension on all the ropes at all times. Otherwise, if somebody let go of a rope, the rest of the ropes would pull me over. Uh, I did the entire piece with my eyes closed. Uh, and yeah, I should have worn a helmet. I thought about that after. Just like this is the only text slide, rest of it's got images, but you know, it's like something that I thought was really important to share is that, you know, some of my work takes weeks, some of it takes months, some of it's taken years. Um, something when I was younger, you know, I just thought I had to produce and show and be in front of the art world at all times. And as I've gotten older in my career, you know, I've had to have a lot of conversations with that. And about that, and I've learned that productivity still happens every day. That's all that matters to me. Um, you know, it doesn't mean I have to show all the time. And that was a huge relief. It was, uh, it allowed me more time to expand my process and to do more research. And uh, it's been very freeing. But each work follows, it follows a very simple path. Uh, you know, the four steps, you know, we have, uh, I have to do, you know, pre-production, um, pre-performance, performance, and post-performance, simple. And then I always have a very simple set of rules. Uh, I have to move at least one person emotionally. Um, otherwise, the piece is just a complete failure to me. 
Uh, I have to create a work that is for everyone. My work is very personal when it starts. It comes directly out of my personal experiences, as I believe all art does from everybody. But my goal with every piece is for it to connect to the, the human condition, uh, which is obviously a very large experience and experience. But what's beautiful about that is that that experience is shared entirely everywhere all over the world. Uh, Pre-production, a lot of it goes, you know, I would say that this is about 85% of what I do. Um, as I advance through my career, I've gotten better at it. Uh, it has drawings, it has notes, it has all sorts of stuff. But my first step is actually, I, I call it think, think and more think. Um, I even do this with events and things that I produce and things that I curate. I finish everything in my mind um, before I begin the next steps. Uh, I, I'll, you know, I spend a lot of time, believe it or not, like on the sofa or just going to a park and all I do is think. Um, site visits usually come next. They alter almost everything depending on, you know, I visit multiple times during the day. I, I try to visit when it's raining. I try to visit when it's sunny, if it's an outside piece. And then I go into research. Uh, this can go any direction, uh, whether it's items, um, you know, a little bit more about the location. History uh, is super important to me. Um, if there's, you know, a background to the place that I'm working, I like to know more about it. Uh, I did a piece at the, um, the Texas theater and like I decided to go and talk about Howard Hughes and his connection to mental health, but he had a direct connection to the Texas theater. So this is where history plays directly into my design. Uh, then I build my team. I haven't had a single piece that I've done alone. Um, and I'm grateful for that. You know, I, I have people, I can't draw. Luckily I have friends that can, I can't, you know, I can talk about what I want something to be, but I have people that can take it to the next level and that can build it. Um, I get, you know, for Visible Shell, I had a, a hundred volunteers. I had additional performers. I had safety people. I had nurses, I had doctors, I had police. I had, you know, tech team that, cause I live streamed it. You know, this is, all comes back to the think, think, think. And then safety. Um, a lot of my work can be uh, a little bit dangerous and I don't ever want to get hurt. So, and then the, one of the number one rules is no full testing of a single performance ever. I put this one image of uh, what looks like me long jumping. Um, that was supposed to be fully upright. Uh, that was the second test of a sculpture, live sculpture where I was about to do the very next day. And uh, we hadn't fixed the problem yet, but you know, sometimes you have to go into performances. So this was our last chance to, to fix the problem. Luckily uh, we did and it stood um, after the piece was done. And another thing that I'm doing in pre-production, uh, pre which is new, is that uh, I've learned to document from day one um, to tell the process because I feel like one of the things that people don't always get um, about performance is this process, everything that happens before. And the incredibly new thing for me is I work with a PR team. You know, somebody asked me earlier today, you know, how do I get the word out? I was like, I have other people help me now. Um, you know, can't always go that direction financially, but when I can, it makes a big difference. Uh, Pre-performance, some of this stuff is obvious. Uh, installation, uh, more documentation. I start to get into what I call the zone. More than likely installation is one to three days. Uh, you know, most of us are used to, I mean, with performance, I'm normally, you know, invited in, if I'm lucky, 24 hours before. And then I usually have to disappear within 24 hours afterwards. Once I've done the install, I just have to go back to, again, it's the think, think, think process. Um, this is when uh, I start to grow quiet uh, as being a performance artist. You know, at this point, I've taken all the data in. I've taken all the information in that I possibly can. 
and I have to start to mentally prepare what's going to come next. Because uh, I've tested everything that I can, but what's going to happen is still an unknown. Um, it's, for instance, if I know I'm going to talk at a performance, that's all I want to tell myself. Uh, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. I just, I'll have an idea around a concept. And then I, I literally just, whatever comes out of me is what happens. Uh, visible shell, for instance, I wrote one sentence for 48 hours. I did not predetermine the sentence. Uh, I'm really glad the sentence wasn't terrible because uh, I was terrified somebody had just used a drill and screwed me into a box. Um, and what I, what I wrote was to see myself, I went inside my own shell. And that's exactly what I did. This is, um, I'll talk a little bit about this one. Uh, this piece uh, was, I completed this in 2020. Uh, there's a lot of examples in this piece that I did right. And there's huge examples in this piece that I did wrong. Um, this is the first piece I almost completely failed. Uh, I almost couldn't, I physically almost couldn't make it to the end. Um, this was, you know, a response to 2020. Uh, I decided at the end, at the beginning of December in 2020, that I just, I couldn't get to uh, the end of a, a year, especially a year like 2020 without producing some sort of performance. So I put the call out uh, to the community and asked them, what do you wanna see from me? What do you wanna hear? So I took all those ideas into play and uh, I developed this concept. Uh, basically, the actual performers in this piece are, are the participants that come through. Um, I'm simply part of a vessel that people get to leave uh, their emotions with so that hopefully they can get to you know, the other side. Uh, this, is, this is a piece I did not, not only did I not test it, I didn't physically train for it either. And this is where the problem came in. Uh, you know, I, I think within an hour into this piece, I was in searing pain. This piece went from actual sunup to sundown. So I think that was 7.29 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. So, it's, you know, about 10 hours. And every, you know, the, the way the piece worked is, you know, you entered, you can see the overhead view. Um, Christian Vasquez was there. Super grateful, he got his drone out there, got this great capture. Um, but you entered the piece from the, from the bottom and you had to write a statement or something, you know, a feeling that you wanted to leave behind in 2020. And then metaphorically, you were transferring that emotion to a stone. And I was the receiver of that emotion. So everybody was super kind. They were supposed to pile everything on top of me, but the, the statement, you know, what they were told is it at least had to touch me. So very few people, you know, put stones on me. But the one thing I did test, I know that the human body can withstand uh, 40 pounds per square inch at any given moment. Uh, and it might be higher than that. I've slept since then. But that's the kind of stuff I have to figure out in advance. Like, am I going to get crushed? Will I have a rib cage at the end of this piece? Um, that was not the difficult part. So once they received, you know, released that emotion, they traveled through to a writing process and they wrote aspirations, letters, whatever they wanted. And when they were done, they exited. The whole concept of this piece uh, relates to a lot of my work. Um, I want people to be uh, in a reflective place. I want them to be fully engaged. I want the work to be about them and not about me. Um, you know, it's like I, I, I ask people, I ask a lot of people in my work. I ask them to, to dig into their own, you know, vulnerability and, and trust me with it. And I've been very lucky uh, since... Uh, 2012, I've received a lot of emotions. Um, I've done pieces that uh, 
one in particular called Unburden, where people can literally tell me whatever they want. I'm locked in a prison cell that I built uh, with a prison phone, and I can never repeat what I've been told. Uh, I've, you know, I've had so many people come and tell me the craziest things, and even people I know, and they know that I will never bring it up. It's it's very humbling to know that that people will give you that much trust. But again, how I almost failed in this piece, um, the last five hours uh, were terrible. Uh, it was cold that day, it didn't rain because it was supposed to, so I was very grateful. But um, I almost didn't make it because I didn't train. And you know, people, I was like, mm, I'm laying down, how hard can it be? Um, you just have to pre-think about all these things. Like invisible shell, I slept in a tent for a week to prepare myself and acclimate myself to the weather. Um, I sat on hard surfaces, not for prolonged, like incredibly long periods of time, but just to see how my body would, react, would be reacting. I had a dietitian to talk to me about how nutrients, how I could work with my body. But because of the nature of this piece being three weeks in training to, to execution, um, I almost didn't make it. Uh, sheer will and the fact that uh, I didn't want 2020 to be the year that beat me. <laughs> so I just, I just wrote it through, but you know, in all honesty, yeah, I was, I was nervous about this one. And uh, that leads to, you know, kind of today, um, an example of, you know, where I'm heading uh, next is uh, I'm working on a piece that is hopefully the end of November. Uh, just to give an idea of uh, this piece was designed probably two years ago. And I'm finally at a place where I can start working on it the next stages. Uh, I have to do intense physical training um, from now until November. Uh, it requires a 10 pound weight loss every month, uh, incredible strength training, um, learning how to balance and carry uh, uneven um, weight loads, uh, how to carry the weight load barefoot, um, what it's like on an uneven surface, uh, these are all the things I have to take into account. Uh, the piece is only going to be three hours, but I have to be very physically trained for this work. Um, the pandemic and life have changed the shape of my body. So uh, that athlete that I think I still am up here kind of doesn't exist anymore. So I don't know if I can do this piece. Uh, we'll see, hopefully in November. Uh, I've also started for the first time, I am... Uh, chronicling this piece every Friday. Uh, I give updates of where I'm at, uh, what my failures are, what my, what my wins are, my successes. And I do all that at the same time while I'm working. Um, I don't know, uh, something that baffles uh, a lot of people in my family is, you know, one of the first things they asked is, well, who buys performance art? <laughs> and it always makes me laugh. Because, you know, I don't do this uh, for any of that. I do this to share um, an open, vulnerable state with the world. Uh, I hope that I get to continue to do this for as long as my body will let me. Uh, like I said back at the beginning, when I went from photography to uh, performance, uh, it was another one of those things. I came up with the concept, I came up with the idea, and I did it. And somebody came up to me later and said, oh, you're an endurance performance artist. And I said, sure. And I went home and I Googled and um, I did a, a image search and uh, I was right next to the grandmother of all performance art, uh, Marina. And so humbling, so crazy. And, you know, it's been, it's been a hoot ever since and painful and tears and I have tons of notes, tons of letters that people have left me. I also have a storage unit filled of the most bizarre things. If, in, you know, something that I think about is, will I exhibit this further in the future? So I do have a, you know, bag of six dodgeballs. I do have 
a pile of stones. I do have journals and all kinds of stuff that wetsuit that I'm wearing, you know, it's like, I keep, I keep as much as I can. Um, if it's not too big, uh, I never wanted to see visible shell again. So we destroyed it. I'm uh, very grateful for that. Let it go to other artists, but yeah, my career has been, has grown through just curiosity, I guess is the best way to describe it. Uh, I learned through very unexpected spaces and places and from people uh, like uh, I'm moving into a lot of, you know, earth-based uh, performance. And so, you know, Andy Goldsworthy was always somebody I was super fascinated by. And, you know, obviously Spiral Jetty and, you know, very, very obvious examples that connect to the visual aspects of my work. But, you know, I don't, I, I don't look into a lot of the history of performance. I've been looking into it lately, but in a strange way, photography was my trainer. And it's been, um, it's been the tool, you know, I learned how to produce because of photography. I know how to create a performance work because of photography. Um, I'm a stylist, I am, the creative director. I am everything that was on a set. It's just in real life now. And, um, and then I have to figure out how to clean up after the fact, which that piece was a bit of a bear on the screen. But um, yeah, so at the end, you know, it's just the thing that I can say about anything or everything. My career got to where it is today because I just say yes plain and simple. Um, I don't have a magic formula. I don't have, you know, the, there's no big reveal. Uh, and I dream big, you know, several artist friends of mine over the years have said, well, if your ideas were just smaller, you'd probably be able to work a lot more. And uh, I, you know, the answer is, I just go along for the ride. My brain is what guides the course. And, uh, the ideas don't come from my physical self, they come from my mind. So that's it guys. My email's down at the corner, my email address. Uh, just like I said, I just say yes. If anybody ever wants to talk about anything, coffee, again, you know how to get a hold of me. Hopefully I didn't speak too fast. Looks like we're okay. No, that was wonderful, thank you. Do we have any questions? Uh, feel free to use the chat too. I'm more than happy to read them or Erica can read them. I'm gonna stop sharing so we're not staring at my eyeball. There we go. Okay, much better. Hi, Erica. Um, thank you so much for being here for our students. I, I have a question, so much of your work is about community collaboration. I'm really fascinated by the emotional part of, you know, being <clears throat> really the conduit or the receptacle or the the place where people put, especially in 2020, I, I think about that piece that you made and, or um, the one where you were talking about how you're in a, um, a jail cell and people can say whatever they want. And so I wonder like the, you know, we heard about the the emotional or physical training that you do in order to prepare for these performances. But I think about the aftermath, you know, I mean, I can, you know, we're so sensitive and I mean, you're an artist, I'm sure you're like incredibly sensitive to all kinds of stimuli. And I mean, hearing all of this information, I mean, I, I wonder what kind of aftermath I feel like oh my gosh there must be some kind of like PTSD or you know I mean that you go through after having these ex these very intense experiences with people in um, a finite period of time so I'm just really is there like an exercise you do to like sage yourself or you know, like how does it work <laughs> Well, for the piece I just recently did, it's the first time I actually had a ceremony done, a, a cleansing before I went in mm -hmm. and then an additional cleansing when I exited. Um, that was a saging, it was petals. It's a friend that 
this is what she does. And then I just walked off, you know, I just left and I wasn't available for conversations. Um, but I did come back. I gave myself about 15 minutes, mostly for a bathroom break, but um, still, you know, every piece is a little different. I did a piece called Behind the Closed Door um, where I was a woman that hadn't left her house in over a month. Um, I had three sets of stage um, dress, uh, set designers come in and destroy my home entirely, uh, which is scary to me in general. And people were allowed to, you know, filter through my space for an entire day and, and just live with that woman. And then they were asked to read notes afterwards. And I don't know how I'm going to feel after each piece. Uh, that piece, um, I just wanted to Topo Chico and to read the letters. You know, it sounds silly. Sometimes it's a huge relief. Um, Unburden is the, the prison cell. I'm just humbled more than anything. Um, I have an enormous ability that I've learned over the years to take in emotional response. Uh, it's, it started from training when I was a kid, which may sound silly, but I was, I, I was brought in as a peer counselor in elementary school and I was trained on how to, uh, you know, not react to human response and to digest it and for it's not like, totally engulf who you are as a person. So I almost compartmentalize um, that. But, uh, you know, thus far, it hasn't affected me too much emotionally. But, uh, you know, sleep, sleep is the biggest thing. I'm usually just tired. So and, and humbled. I really am just just humbled. So, so great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Erica. My name is uh, Cher Musico. Um, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say um, I became aware of your work probably, I don't know if it's about 15 years ago or so through um, Hal Samples when he had space wow. down there. So um, I try to stay connected with Hal and, and Carissa. So is it when I saw Chris's name on that one photo, it was exciting to see. But I just wanted to say I'm ecstatic to see the growth of work that you've had throughout the year. So thank you very thank you. much. Yeah, you just brought back an old name there share that <laughs> I celebrated my 30th birthday at space. So thank you. I wanted to ask a question. Um, I feel like this is so useful uh, for students who may be considering performance. Um, and I wonder kind of how long it took you to get that code for yourself about, about what standards you had. I mean, I feel like a little bit of it has echoes of being dissatisfied with certain ways of doing it. So then saying like, I'm not, it's not valuable unless someone reacts emotionally or I'm not gonna do it unless I do it under these conditions. Did that take a long time to confidently have a set of things? Or was that something that's just sort of a way you approached it early on? It was immediate. Um, it's from day one is the first piece and it's out of fear probably is the best way to describe it. Um, I want people to, I want it to be relevant and to the, to, the, to the watcher. I want the person to feel like they are part of something, that they belong there, um, that it is specifically for them. Um, and that scares me, you know, each time I ask a bunch of questions, I'm like, does this make sense? Do, do you understand? Do you think this is gonna resonate? Um, I panic before every performance, um, and I, I ask a bunch of people afterwards if they thought that it was successful, because um, there are times where I feel like it wasn't. So, um, and I also, I can not remember the name of the artist right now, which is weird because it's my mantra, but it was from an Art 21 a really long time ago. I was a sculptor, and she said, you know, if people don't get it, I failed. And, and like that has always stuck with me um, for it since, you know, since I was in my early twenties. So, yeah. Thanks. Hi, Erica. Hi, Julie. <laughs> um, I just wanna like 
preach that I, I think you're one of the hardest working people I've ever uh, encountered, worked with, collab had the great fortune to collaborate with. And so there is that theme throughout a lot of your performances about effort. And I think um, one of my kind of questions is, or, or observations too, is like, I love the way um, you shared your process, right? Again, like you can't even help but emphasize process <laughs> and you're always learning from the feedback and it's, it is a process. So, but how do you, oh, how do you plan for openness? Because you are such a planner, <laughs> you know, and then you have this sort of, when do you know that that's like a, um, like you said, you almost have like a rule that maybe you don't talk to someone or um, each case is different maybe, but how do you kind of protect the um, openness without controlling an outcome or, you know, I, I'm... I, it varies. <laughs> um, like I'd prefer if I had my druthers for every piece to be silent um, because speaking to me is, is terrifying. And it also, um, can in an indirect way direct a response. Um, I, I don't, you know, one of my favorite things about performance, about art in general, is that when you ask people, what did it mean to you? And you're like, I don't even think about that. So, um, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, I, the way that I handle it is that I don't handle it in a way, if that makes sense. And for a planner, that is the most nerve wracking part. I'll use building beauty as an example. Um, I knew I was gonna sculpt my body live. Uh, I knew this would be my first uh, nude piece I've ever done. Um, and I was able to put myself in the zone, like that was my job. That's what I had to do. I had to be present um, for those in the room. But what I didn't know is what was gonna come out of me. I thought I did. I had six sentences that were prompts behind me. And instead I told the story of my life and my, you know, disconnect and, and just issues with, you know, positive body image. And, you know, it's like, I, I'm kind of rambling, Julie, sorry, but like as a planner, I deliberately leave a space in there that is for an unpredictable response, which goes against everything I do. <laughs> For anybody that knows me, Julie's right. I plan everything down to like, you know, what's the, what's the thread I'm gonna use in a sock before I make the sock? Like it's, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> and kind of remarkable too that you have, because I can also attest to your ability to like, just really accept um, all kinds of unexpected events or, or, you know, ways of people, you know, kind of circumstances and, and then to have that sort of space for catharsis, I guess is, it's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Erica. Um, my name is Kenneth. Um, I never performed before, and I'm just wondering if you can share how you know it's time to perform. I mean, how, how you, you, you become perform at transition at one point. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate your, your work. It really moved me want to become a performer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yay, come join us. Um, <laughs> thank you for the question. Uh, it was a natural transition. Uh, the way I call it is, you know, I just jumped what I was already doing off the wall. Um, I was a conceptual photographer. It was rooted in process and ideas. Um, to me, my photography was just a moment captured in a moving piece a moving story, a moving image. Um, so the very next idea that I had, you know, it's like, it just naturally, you know, I was experiencing um, loss, uh, you know, equipment. It was, it was very emotional for me to, to basically lose my career. 
um, as I'd known it. And just, I was sitting there one day and I just turned to a friend and I said, I have to lock myself in a box. And that was it. I mean, I don't have any magic reason for it. Um, it's just where my brain went. I knew, honestly, I knew nothing of performance art. I just, I could see it, I could visualize it. And um, I built a great team around me and, and I went for it. So um, I guess the choice, the way I describe it to my life in general is that whenever I'm supposed to change course or direction, uh, my whole life, uh, something tragic has happened. Um, I'm so stubborn that I need to have the most obvious thing put in front of me. So I think my equipment being stolen was a catalyst. Uh, so I changed through trauma, uh, in a sense. And that's not, you know, it's different for everybody, but um, that's definitely how my work has changed. Uh, I became a photographer again after, you know, becoming sober. You know, it was a whole new world, whole new life. I was like a baby, you know, I was an open nerve and, and uh, the camera was my way to see the world again. You know, so it's, it's just been this natural transition from basically trauma to rebirth. And, and uh, that's how I got there. And then I slowly learned, um, you know, the other thing too for me is that I already had been a producer. So that part already made sense to me. So that was definitely part of it. Thank you. Hi, Erica. Thank you so much um, for your talk. I really enjoyed hearing about the performances and how inspiring you are to our students. And I was wondering if you talk a little bit more about how you, like the safety that you consider, like your safety and how to maintain that, and maybe some considerations for people who are interested in going into performance art so they can do that in a way that protects themselves and others. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Sarah, for the question. It's a, it's something I can't put a stronger emphasis on. Um, a lot of people go into performances that I see uh, that scare me. Um, I want to know like what they did to prepare. Um, you know, it's like visible shells, an example. Um, I did everything from mind, body and soul prep for that one. Uh, like I said, I had doctors, I had to have a catheter put in, um, you know, for two days, you know, you got to like I had to work through all those details. So I do medical stuff as well. Uh, I had to work with a doctor to, to go on birth control. You know, it's like everything to make sure a success, but also, you know, I had a cop on site because I was there for multiple times. And so this comes back to the, the think, think, think process is what I call it. And you have to identify your danger zones um, and really think through it. Uh, you know, it's like, I've seen some pieces where like, you know, an artist could have pulled their hair out of their head. And I just wonder, I'm like, what was the planning they thought when they went into that? Now, granted, I know some performance art, like pain is part of the, the piece itself. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I, it's just imperative. That's part of the thinking process. And like this piece that I'm working on now, um, I have micro tears in my Achilles tendon. Uh, I have to prepare for that. I have to fix it. I have to, I know um, my physical therapists know what I want to do. My doctors know what I want to do. Um, I work with everybody. Uh, the, the, the design elements go into safety. Um, will they proportionately hold the weight the way I need them to? Um, if they don't, where are the weak spots? Uh, it's all about extensive thinking and finding the weak spots in advance. Uh, and I've made mistakes, you know, uh, luckily they haven't been incredibly bad ones. Um, but you know, I didn't take certain weather into account. I didn't, you know, certain stuff like that, but, but the big ones, um, always think through it. Uh, you know, it's like Megan, you asked like some of the pieces I do talk to psychologists and psychiatrists in advance, you know, especially since I suffer from mental illnesses, 
you know, like that's another part of my safety I have to protect. So think it through, I guess would be the biggest, the biggest question. And if you don't know the answer, ask someone, don't be your own professional. You know, if you don't know it, ask somebody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great uh, thing about the the way that you talk about all the people and the support that you um, set up. And I'm curious, you know, I, I know you didn't touch too much on your kind of work in curating other projects, but I know that you have so much experience now with the business side as well as the safety and insurance and just all of the things that really honestly none of us are very well prepared for um and you know i think one of the things i've been thinking about with performance is just um and and i i've heard this from dancers is that in performance maybe we tend not to have uh, so much of an economy to support performance artists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you work with performers or how do you, you know, kind of, um, cause you're working in so many levels. So I, some of that kind of, you know, we also had this idea of making a performance artist support group or you, you were, you know, bringing that up. So, you know, how it's almost the management and, and best practices. So, and I, I don't know if that's a very specific question, but <laughs> it is a process, just like everything else. Um, one of the most difficult things, you know, one of the most freeing things and one of the most difficult things about performance art is that nobody's going to pay you for it unless you get commissioned for it. Nobody's going to commission you for it before you've done it a ton of times. That's true for all of us, you know. It's like, welcome to the art world, but um, well, every world, you know need a degree, but you need three years experience. It's like, how can you have both? Um, so performance art is tricky. Uh, it's expensive. My work is very expensive. Um, and I try not to do that, but it happens every time. And so, yeah, I'm trying to build a network of other performers. Uh, thanks to Julie, uh, her recommendation. Yes. And, um, the business side of art is very difficult. You know, I said to somebody earlier today, I said, welcome to being your own business. And basically, and this is something that I think is something we need to be focusing more as a whole, as a community. Um, we need to understand the ins and outs. I've made a ton of mistakes. If you have a question, always, I say yes, ask me. Um, I haven't gotten the proper insurance. I haven't gotten the proper permit. I haven't dealt with the proper safety protocols. Uh, I haven't, I didn't know I could fundraise for my work, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and these are the kind of things we need to learn. I'm learning it in the nonprofit sector. I have been for a very long time. I also had a commercial background, uh, which helped me establish a business structure. Um, everything from super simple. Like I didn't even know how to invoice something when I got started, but uh, you know, these, these things are common that we don't, we don't know um, when to get an accountant. You know, it's like, how do you work with a full crew? You know, how do you go about like my goal one day, my dream is to be able to have my own studio team and to be able to give a good wage to every single person that I work with. Um, I'm in a great place right now um, where people just won't let me pay them, which I refuse for that to continue to be the case. Uh, it's very humbling, it's very kind, but you know, you should have a goal, be a business. Um, we, we deserve it. That's the other thing I like to tell people, um, no offense to plumbers, but like we never question paying a plumber. So don't question getting paid for yourself. I don't know if that answered that, Julie, but yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated, Erica, with like the flow and art flow that artists get into. And is when you're in more of a risk state, do you feel that? Or um, is there a reward like to the scar kind of part 
that you carry with the work or um, I'm just curious about those things. Sometimes, um, you know, it, I got something out of visible shell that um, it only lasted maybe two seconds, but it's the best reward I've ever been given in life. And it was for two seconds of my entire existence. I didn't care about anything. I felt this total bliss and it took a lot of pain to get there. You know, I sat in a hard chair for who knows how long it was probably 15 or so hours in. And um, so there is, there is some glory in the struggle. Um, but I also, I'm uniquely attached to struggle as well. Um, it's part of my everyday life. So I don't have a day that's easy. You know, um, like I said, mental health, I'm bipolar. I have severe social anxiety. Like every day I step outside of this house, it's, it's tricky. So it's almost like it's validation in my work because people can't see the struggle that I walked with every day, but they can see it in the work. So I don't know if that makes any sense, yeah, but it's yeah, it's a, a nice answer. Do we have maybe one more question for Erica? Well, Erica, thank you so much for your time, your information, everything. This has been wonderful. Uh, super, super honored to have you here and uh, be a part of their little TW community. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much.